Praise the Lord. Welcome in the name of the Lord. Wonderful to be with you guys. Second service in 2023. So I was going to say first one, but it's the first one with John. First one with John and of many more. And I'm not sure how many, but it is a wonderful, wonderful day to start a new book. Start a new year, start a new book with a fresh commitment, with a fresh commitment to the Lord. And uh, so I just wanted to remind everyone, I know Roy talked about the Bible studies during the week. We have them. Please take a look at your bulletin to find out more about it. We also have a Wednesday midweek service if you want to. Uh, we're going through Jeremiah at the moment. And uh, we're talking about a lot of things, prophecy, Jeremiah, things that relate to the nations. Uh, so good stuff on Wednesdays. And then the other su uh, subjects, different subjects on different days uh, throughout the week. So get your bulletin. And uh, we meet in the different locations. So they're home Bible studies. So um, it's always enjoy home fellowship. So uh, glad to see everybody today. Happy New Year to those who uh, weren't here last week. Happy New Year. And uh, today we begin a profound book. It is called the most profound book in the New Testament. Even though there's revelation, you would say, well, how can John be so profound? You would say, it's so easy. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Well, that would be great if we were, you know, in a, in, in a, in a young believer's class or if we were in children's ministry, but we're not. And so uh, the most profound book in the Bible is going to take us into a deeper commitment and relationship with Jesus. That's the goal. And it has a unique affection personally in my life, and allow me to share that with you very quickly, as a young believer, this, this book had a dramatic change in my life, a dramatic change in my life, and just reading it and understanding more of who Jesus is. I used to say who he really was. He still is. Um, and it emerges with a fresh look at Jesus, different than the other Gospels, perhaps different than the letters of Paul, as wonderful as all Scripture is. There's something about John. There's just something about John, and I think if you have read John and it had an impact in your life, you can understand what I'm saying. There's just something about John. It's so, it's so profound. It's so unique. It took about 60 years to be written, meaning that John didn't begin to write right away. The other writers had the Gospels out by 20, 25 years after Jesus had risen and ascended. John took longer than that. John took maybe 40, 50, 60 years in some cases, we would say, that it took that long for him to write such a wonderful book. Now, when you had to think about something for, let's say, 60 years, it's profound, isn't it? You ever thought about something for, about for 60 years? You're not even 60 yourself, right? But if you had to think about something that long, and you weren't going to write it until you knew that it was God who was prompting you to write. It's something that is going to be deep. But yet, the Gospel of John, it's given to a lot of new believers, isn't it? Why would a, such a profound book be given to new believers? Are we doing a great damage to new believers by giving them something that perhaps they may not quite understand? Questions, right, that we have to ask. But I'll answer that in, in the study. Uh, this series is going to be called, As for You, Follow Me. As for you, follow me. And I would, have, I would have named it come and see because that's what Jesus says in John 1, come and see, as he, as he calls his disciples. And he called Andrew and John and Peter and, 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 uh, and James. But I called it as for you, come and see, because this is the last part of John. We'll get to that, I don't know, some point around the election, 2024, something like that. We'll be in John 21. Um, you think I'm kidding. Um, yeah. But we'll make it pleasant throughout the process so you, you, you'll get something out of it. Um, Jesus tells Peter, because Peter's focusing on John, right? There's a story. Uh, you know, Peter's denied the Lord. John is, um, John's there. Peter's there. And Peter's being restored back to Christ. And then Peter says, well, what about John? And he says, don't worry about John. He goes into a longer uh, answer, but I'm not going to say it. You don't worry about John. As for you, come follow me. You know, so many of us may be looking at other believers in our lives and go, 
well, what about them? And, and, and you know, look at God's doing them in, in their life. And look what God's doing in their life. And yet the Lord is very pointing at you saying, well, what about you? As for you, you come and follow me. Don't necessarily worry about them. Now, we, we do are concerned about believers, of course, but uh, you know what I'm saying. We're looking so deep into their lives that you wonder, you know, well, I'm doing okay, but look what, that, what, look what they're doing. As for you, follow me. So I'm very mindful of John's purpose in writing this gospel, which is to let us know who Jesus is and to believe in his name. Now, that word believe is, is quite pregnant with meaning. And we're going to talk about that at the end. This is just an introduction today, so we're not going to go through the exegetical passages, although I will say that you're going to have an assignment at the end of the study. You're going to have an assignment. Oh, no, I escaped school for for that reason, right? Come to church and get assignments. But you're going to have an assignment, and we'll tell you what that is. Um, John says that you may believe in his name, and by believing in the Son of God, you may have life. You may have life. So we're going to take Jesus at his word. We're going to take John at his word. And um, it's a wonderful introduction. There's a lot of questions. Hopefully we can answer uh, most of them and maybe answer some of the questions you didn't even have, which sometimes that happens. I wasn't even looking for that question, but, you know, sometimes we answer things that people are not asking. But hopefully we can level the playing field and say, John is an amazing book and calls you and I to a deeper relationship with Jesus. And there's a reason why he wrote it. You know, John just didn't go, well, it seems like a good time to end my life and I'm going to write about Jesus. There's a very peculiar reason why he wrote it and I think it's very important for us. So let's pray and ask the Lord for his help. Lord, we come to you with an open Bible and an open heart and an open mind. Lord, our hearts may be broken, our hearts may be grieved and saddened, our hearts may be joyful, our heart may be an expectation, but you know how to heal a broken heart, you know how to restore a broken heart and and give us a joyful heart. And so, Lord, we come to you with every need possible, but Lord, the greatest need that we have is to hear from you today. And so, Lord, we, we, as it were, lay everything at your feet. Lord, our problems, our issues, our difficulties, and present ourselves as a sacrifice, living to you and asking you to open our minds to your word, speak to us, and give us the power of the Holy Spirit to execute it. For in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have you ever wondered why we have four gospels? Ever wonder that? You know, this is a common thing, especially among new believers, and some skeptical believers, that couldn't it be easier to just have one? Why do we need to know four times the story of Jesus? Well, the four Gospels, we call them the evangelists, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all speak of the same thing, the life of Jesus. And people have tried to put the Gospels together. In fact, uh, you would even find books. You can find books. One is called The Harmony of the Gospel. And it's a good book. It just puts everything in a parallel. You know, you guys are like formats. Some of you guys like formats and structure, right? It's a good book. Some of you guys that don't, I'll be like, you're going to hate that book. But if you do, it's got neat little outlines and neat little lines parallel tell you which part is Matthew and which part is Mark and which part is Luke. And you could see that there's a harmony in those three. And then they get to John and they go, what do we do with this one? Because it's unique. It doesn't follow a nice little parallel structure that we all like. At least as Americans, sometimes we do, right? Um, so why four? Each one stands on its own. Some people would say, well, they're all the same thing, so just read one, you'll get the, you get the whole thing. No, 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 no. Each one is a portrait of Jesus. Each one is a portrait of Jesus. Yes, collectively we can say we get the whole thing. Yes, the whole picture. But each one is unique in that the nuances and the, and the geography and the history and some of the stories that are told there are there to bring us a realization that we have a Bible that is inspired, meaning that none one of these books, the four of them, are a definitive. None of them are definitive. Um, each one stands on its own. You can't say, well, I'm just going to read Mark because I think that's the best one. Or Luke, that's the best one. We may have our likes and dislikes, but they all authenticate something that happened. 
the Spirit of God inspired each one of them to write something unique. And they all have variations. Even the three that agree on a lot of things, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all have variations. Slightly, but they do have variations. You know, if you were to judge, if you were a judge and if you were in a court, a, um, you would dismiss the witnesses that have the exact same uh, account. Why? Because it sounds like collusion. You guys all talked. You guys all agree to say the same thing. And you bring it out, and that would be of no value and be dismissed in court. Because witnesses are to give their proper account of the same thing, but the uniqueness causes that testimony to be valid, and your testimony to be valid, and my testimony to be valid. And this is what happened to all the writers of the Bible, not just the gospel writers. It was the inspiration of the Spirit, of the Spirit Peter says, Second Peter 1. The inspiration of the Spirit, the Spirit moved them according to what God wanted in. Uh, some wrote in poetry, some wrote in, in prose, some wrote in history, some wrote in letters like the epistles. Some wrote in different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, right? The three languages used. Some of them never, uh, some of them were outside of Israel. Some of them lived in Israel. But the glaring thing is there's a unity in the Bible. That's the, the wonderful thing about the Bible. And we can spend, believe me, I'm very tempted to go into like a New Testament survey class and just explain how unique the Bible is and how wonderful it is and how it, it's beyond precious. So that the psalmist says it's more it's better than silver and gold because it's inspired, but it's not automatic writing, meaning that God just didn't take over the person's pen and begin to write things. It actually used the person's style and education and intelligence and, 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 and experience to write something that God had ordained, and each one of those words were exactly what God wanted, even though the writer was using his own style and expression, which is the amazing thing about inspiration, but that's a class. We're not here for that class. But it is interesting. Which gospel was written first? It's one of the questions we always ask, right? And most scholars, and I agree with this, um, is Mark seems to be the gospel that was written first. It is the shortest of the gospels. So if you have um, you know, some kind of attention deficit you know, disorder in terms of reading, Mark is your book. You know? um, no offense, but people like Mark. Why? It cuts right to the chase, doesn't it? doesn't even have a nativity story. It just tells you that Jesus did this and did this and did this and did this. And by the time you get to Mark 7, they're already plotting to kill him. And you're just, you know, halfway through the book. And it's uh, actually not even 7. I think it's 5. They're plotting to kill him. And now you're just down, downhill from there, all the way to the cross. And it's a wonderful book because it leads right to the cross. Matthew and Luke were written a little bit afterwards. Were written a little bit afterwards. And yes, they did use some of the material in Mark, which by the way, it wasn't Mark's account. It was Peter's account. Peter gave Mark all the accounts that he experienced. And that's why Mark is very unique. Has some things about Peter that are not found anywhere else. But it's a, it, it's a brief account of what Jesus did through Peter's eyes. Matthew and, and Luke build on that. And obviously, they're bigger books. And they concentrate not on what Jesus did, but on what Jesus said. So what you find is a lot of teachings of Jesus. And a lot of teachings of Jesus in terms of his parables, the stories that he wrote, that he, that he told. And, he's very, and, and Matthew's very interested from a Jewish perspective that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. And you can see it right away. Gives you the genealogy, tells you all about it. Luke, on the other hand, tells you that he is a man, a son of man, and a savior of the world. And so he's very interested in the Gentiles and how they came to faith in Jesus. So um, all of us Gentiles would appreciate that, right? That's a wonderful book for believers. And in fact, for new believers, a great book to read. The thing is, we don't give Luke out as much as we do John. So what about John? Um, the unique thing about John, and the reason why we give it to new believers, is his theology, the theology of John is impressive. The theology of John is impressive. So go with me, not to John 1, John 20. John 20. Because John has a unique purpose for why he wrote this. And I just want to touch this because, uh, like I told you, we're not going to do an exegetical study on it. We're just going to touch on it and give you the man, the introduction, the understanding. John 20, 30 and 31. Therefore, many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples, 
which are not written in this book. But these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and believing in him, in his name, you may have life in his name. It's a very important question. The reason we give it to new believers is because of that very reason. We want new believers to continue to believe. And we'll come back to that in a moment because John writes it in a very peculiar Greek that is not found in other Gospels. The, the, the Greek of John is magnificent, especially when he uses the word belief. He never uses it as a one-time event. He actually uses it as a continuous action that you must continue in it. We'll come back to that. A very important question, who wrote the Gospel, though? You've been telling John, 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 but did you know that the gospel itself, the book itself, does not have an author? It's anonymous. It doesn't tell you, I, John, wrote this. In fact, it never tells you. The book is anonymous in a sense of the author cloaks his identity throughout the book, many different opinions about the gospel, right, who wrote it, but the majority, we do say that it was John, right? Uh, church history has always believed it was John. In fact, we have an important figure in history, if you, want, if you like church history, as I do. Blessed are you. If you don't like it, I pray for you, right? But no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it's important. I, I, I think it's important. Sorry about that. I, um, there's a man named Irenaeus. Irenaeus is an important church uh, figure, a teacher in history. And he was a disciple by another man named Polycarp, which you might have heard him. And Polycarp was disciple by John, the apostle. And so we have a clear connection that Irenaeus had met John, at least knew somebody that had met John, and guess what? Um, he said it was John. Um, Clement of Alexandria said it was John as well. Uh, these are important church history figures, and both believe that it was John, and it's always been believed that it was John. However, modern scholarship has come to our demise, maybe not our rescue, but our demise, and they said, it couldn't be John. There's just too many things, right? In fact, one of the things that they say wasn't John, and, and I'm just, you know, giving you some apologetics to defend this, because you might hear things uh, throughout your Christian journey. Well, where was John from? Anybody know where John the Apostle, where was he from? He was from Galilee. He was from the north. But yet, when you read the gospel, where most of the stories, 99% of the stories take place down in Jerusalem, down in Judea. Why would a Galilean know about the Judean and the things in Jerusalem? And he seems to know very well the area. It couldn't be John. He was from Galilee. You know, it must have been a writer from the south, they say. Another skeptical says, well, why do we assume that John was the apostle that Jesus loved? I mean, that's how he calls himself in the book. But why do we assume it's him? In fact, we're told in the Bible that there was one guy that Jesus loved plenty of times. In fact, we're told that in John 11, verse 3, verse 5, and I think it's verse 20, uh, verse 36, sorry, that Jesus loved this man. He was from Bethany, and his name was Lazarus. And so there are some scholars, actually, that believe that could have been Lazarus who wrote this book. I'm not saying he did, but I'm just saying because of what the evidence says that Jesus loved them three times. Um, another one says it was the rich young ruler. That's kind of a bizarre one, but there are believe, the people that believe that. Because when it's, it says in Mark 10 that when he went away sad, it says that Jesus loved them. Jesus loved them. And so they say it's a hint. This was the man. Now, we have no evidence that he ever came to Christ. We only have evidence that he walked away from Christ. So I, I don't think that's a good one. Now, another popular one is one called John the Elder. John the Elder. And what that means is that there's a, a two letters in the Bible, 2 John and 3 John, that are written by John the Elder. And they believe it was John the Elder who was discipled by John the Apostle who wrote this gospel. There's no evidence in it to say that. And... Um, there's never been a person that we've known in, in church history called John the Elder. In fact, John the Elder is probably John the Apostle, who was an elder of the church in Ephesus. So bottom line is, not to bore you with details, this is not a class for that, is to, when we identify the writer of his name, we're very happy to identify him as John. Now, who was John? 
Who was John the Apostle? Well, he's the son of Zebedee, his son of Zebedee. And he belonged to a fisherman's family, fisherman's family. And he lived north, uh, in the north, in Galilee, north part of the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, or maybe the area of Magdala, which um, I happened to be both in those two places this past year. Very wonderful, beautiful area. It's right on the lake, the lake, Sea of Galilee. And um, it's interesting, that was his dad, Zebedee. His mother was named Salome, Salome. And if an interesting story about John, because Salome is one of the women identified at the cross where Jesus is, when he's crucified, he is, she is one of the women there, the mom of James and John, Salome, the wife of Zebedee. And she's identified not only being there at the crucifixion, but only be, also being there at the empty tomb. They came early in that morning. And Matthew identifies two Marys at the cross. And the third one, she calls the mother of, uh, the, mother of the sons of Zebedee. And John says it was the sister, Salome was the sister of the mother, uh, um, the mother of Jesus and her sister. The mother of Jesus and her sister. So if it wasn't the two Marys, and there was a sister of the, of the, of the mother of Jesus, um, a lot of people believe Salome was the sister of Mary, quite possibly, based on the references in Mark and Matthew. And John calls her the mother of Jesus, and her sister stood at the cross. And it wasn't the other two Marys. It was someone else. Well, put the puzzle together. It could have been Salome. So what does that mean? If Miriam, that's Jesus' mother's name, and Salome, our sister, what makes John and Jesus? First cousins. Exactly, first cousins. So there's a very deep, deeper relationship that we're looking at here. We're not just looking at a disciple, but somebody who knew Jesus from his early age. Zebedee was a fisherman, no doubt. And we see the first time he is called, John is called, he is mending the nets. He is mending the nets. Uh, it's the book of John and the book of Mark, as well as Matthew. Matthew 4 tells us that John was mending the nets. And it was interesting that this was a, a dragnet. That's what they used to use there, a dragnet. And you take the dragnet and you put it down on the bottom of the sea and you drag everything with you and you got great stuff. You get a lot of fish, but you also break the nets because of that. And so one of John's particular jobs was to mend the nets. And it's quite interesting that as you see it in a spiritual way, Whatever John was doing, he's going to continue to do, but now he's going to do it for the church. He is going to mend the nets of what has happened to the church, and he was the last apostle. He was the last one to live, the last one to die, and as effective it is, fishing is is a wonderful thing, but uh, fishing also has a spiritual meaning in the Bible. Anybody know what fishing is where you go out and fish? It's evangelism. That's right. It's evangelism, and when you evangelize, you bring fish right, into the boat, and that's a picture of Jesus bringing us into his church, into his bride, into, as a bride. Um, but what is John doing? He's fixing the nets. Uh, something has happened to the nets. Something has happened to our teaching and our theology. There's people that have gone in and broken the net, and that's why we're not effective in our evangelism and our discipleship. So what does John do? He fixes it. So when you read the Gospel of John, which was written later, it fixes a lot of things that people had started to believe falsely about Jesus. And he fixes it. He mends the nets, as it were. And now we have a clear picture of Jesus. Now, he was also, had a unique temper. Had a unique temper. No offense to anybody who has a temper here. Um, may God bless you. May God work on you. But here's a man. Here's a man who was called the son of thunder. Him and his brother, James and John, were called Sons of thunder in Mark chapter 3, none other by, than by Jesus Christ. Jesus called them the sons of thunder. What does that mean? They were men of violence. They were men of hot temper. They were zealots, perhaps. A lot of zealots at that time were from Galilee. Interestingly enough, uh, Peter, didn't Peter had a, a knife? He brought a knife to a, to a fight one time, right? They were going to arrest Jesus. He had a knife, right? It was a dagger. It was called a machaira. It was a dagger. And it was interesting because at that time, there were a lot of zealots. In fact, one of the disciples was called Simon the Zealot. These were guys who were rough. They were so patriotic of Israel, they didn't want the Romans to be in charge. They didn't want any sort of 
you know, possession of Israel, they were against the, the, the occupation of Rome. And they would kill soldiers and they would uh, do all kinds of attacks and t- almost like terrorists. Well, some of the disciples of Jesus were like that. Violent, hot-tempered men. Why would he pick them? It's my thing, right? And it's interesting. In history, we call them, uh, they call them Sakari, the Sakari, the dagger man, right? So, you know, you look at the disciples, and oftentimes the picture, you look at a painting, and you go, oh, they were just nice boys from Israel, nice Jewish boys who walked around with a, a yarmulke and, and just told everybody nice things. And, no, not at all. These were violent, temper, hot-tempered men who didn't get along with each other a lot of the times, who were in friction with each other, who were jealous of each other, who were infighting. How did Jesus put up with it? I don't know. I should do it on this side. How did Jesus put up with it? I do not know. A tremendous patience and a tremendous love, resulting in the fact that all of a sudden, John becomes, what is he known for? The disciple of love, isn't he? How can a man that resembles thunder... You know, you ever hear thunder? It's kind of scary. It's that's you know, here comes James and John, right? Um, scary thing. Don't don't invite those guys. Don't don't bring them in the church. Don't 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 have prayer meetings with these guys, right? They're about to turn the tables over. That's the kind of attitude he had. But at the end of the day, he goes from a zealot to an apostle of love, and he speaks of the love of Christ, and he leans on Christ for the rest of the book, a transformed life. And that's an amazing thing. And that's one of the reasons people can't believe that John wrote this book because he said, well, if he was a zealot and a thunder man, what is he writing about love? Only the Lord can transform that person. Amen? And maybe the Lord has transformed you. Maybe you have a testimony like that. And maybe the Lord needs to transform you because of your temper and attitude toward maybe believers and other people, right? But John wrote this as an old man. In fact, I told you that earlier. He wrote it later on in his years. He didn't start right away like Mark or Luke or Matthew. And he writes of his three and a half years that he spent with Jesus. And he writes about Jesus in a unique way, right? Because he's different. He's more interested in who Jesus is than what Jesus said. He is more interested in who Jesus is and knowing him than what Jesus did. Not that we don't find those things in John, but the 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 the, 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 the pervasive thing we find in John is that you get to know him. You need to know who he is. And I'm going to show you who he is, his character, his life. And you develop this intimacy with Jesus through this book. And that's my prayer for our church this year, is that we would develop that intimacy, not just coming to church, not just arriving, you know, and, and saying hi to one another, being nice to one another, and escaping when it's late and we got to go. But you develop a love for Christ, and therefore, if you develop that love for Christ, it would automatically develop a love for his people. And maybe you become more like John, that you'll speak of Christ's love more than uh, what Christ has done for you. You would say, well, this is who Jesus is. Isn't it wonderful to talk about what Jesus is more than talk about what Jesus has done for me? Because a lot of times, we say, he's done this for me, he's done this for me, he's done this for me. And it's great. I don't mind that. But... You know, whenever me is involved in that sentence, I'm kind of get a little nervous, right? Because I want him to be about him, right? So if I talk about, isn't it wonderful who Jesus is? Isn't that different than he says, you want to know what Jesus did for me? Great testimony. But do you want to know who Jesus is? I can show you, right? And John is not considered synoptic. This is the other thing. It's not one of the synoptic gospel. Now, I'll tell you what that word means because it sounds too theological. It is not. It just, it means, the word sin means next to, and optic, right, optic, synoptic, you're looking at it next to each other. When you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you look, put them next to each other, and you find out there's harmony. You look at John, who brought the green apple, right? What happened to this book, right? Is it the same, is it the same Jesus? I mean, it says Jesus, it's, it's yeah, it's that the same characters, but boy, he's different, doesn't he? He's different because the other writers were interested in what he taught and what he did. John is going to be interested in who he is. And you fall in love with John's gospel. You fall in love with Jesus, right? And John is being, he writes differently. It's just, you'll see it from a different place. From a, It's a different feel. It's almost hard to explain. Um, what are the differences? So I'm sorry, what are the differences? This is kind of fun to in, include this so you get, get to know a little bit more about John. John did not include the birth of Jesus. 
There's no Christmas story. There's no nativity story. It doesn't mean it's not important. It just means that wasn't his focus, right? It doesn't have the birth of Jesus. It has his coming. It has the incarnation, but not the way the other writers put it together, right? There's no mention of the nativity at all. There's no announcement to Mary. There's no announcement to Joseph. There's no shepherds. There's no Bethlehem, right? And, and so people go like, oh, why not? I said, because well, you could read it in the other Gospels, right? John is not going to talk about that. There's no, there's no word about the baptism of Jesus. Oh, wait a minute. Why not? Was he there? Yeah, he was, but didn't put it in there. There's no word on the transfiguration of Jesus. There's no word on the temptation of Jesus. There's no dealings with demonic spirits. Jesus is not mentioned about dealing with demonic spirits. There's no Garden of Gethsemane. There's no mention of the Lord's Supper uh, or taking it with his disciples. There's no mention of the ascension. What? <laughs> Am I supposed to be reading this book? Yes. And the differences are the things that should draw us into it, isn't it? Because you've got to say, well, those things are important. But if they're not in John, there's got to be a reason why he, put them in. he didn't put them in there, right? And... The reasons, and I will say this, the, the, the one difference, talking about differences, the difference is that also the things he did put in there. So we talk about the things he didn't put in there, right? What are the things he put in there? There are things in this gospel that are so unique. This one included seven signs or seven miracles that are not found in any other gospel. There's seven miracles, and John calls them signs. Why does he call them signs? Because they're not there for you to go, ooh, ah, look at the miracle. They're signs. They're supposed to point to a person. They're supposed to say, get your eyes off the miracle and look at him, look what he just did, and look what he's able to do. And there's seven of them. And so the whole, you know, if you want a little bit of a cheat sheet, the whole book of John is right here. It's related to seven miracles, and each one relates to the wonderfulness of Jesus. And he's going to get to those seven I am statements pretty soon. But he calls them signs because they're just, no one can do this except the Messiah. And every time he does it, it points something about himself, that he's the only one that can make you see. He's the only one that can make you walk with him. He's the only one that can raise you up from the dead, and he's the resurrection and the life. He's the only one that can do any of these things. And so it's an amazing thing. Now, some of the events in John are not in other Gospels, like the washing of the feet. You ever, some people love the story of the washing of the feet. It's only found in John, right? Um, why did it not include the other in the other Gospels, right? It's curious to me, the personal side of me, because Peter told Mark what happened. That's the book of Mark. It's Peter's account. Wasn't Peter involved in that story of the washing of the feet? Why didn't Peter tell Mark? You know, these are questions that I stay up at night sometimes and thinking about that, but he didn't tell him. Maybe Peter was embarrassed, but John tells us all about it. The washing of the feet, right? Some of the events of the resur- after the resurrection are only in John. The breathing of the Holy Spirit into the disciples, it's only in John, right? Um, he appeared to them in, in, in different ways up in Galilee, right? And it's just amazing. We can keep going, right? Uh, the emphasis of the south, right? Not in the north and the south. I think when we did the book of Mark, I had this picture We were tracking Jesus, and most of Mark is in the northern area of Israel, and we keep tracking him down to Samaria, and then he gets all the way to Jerusalem. He has one purpose, the cross. John forgoes all the Galilean stuff and goes right to Jerusalem and says, this is what's important for me. This is the account that I know what happened in Galilee, yes, but John knows what Jesus did in Jerusalem, that it's almost like piercing because you don't get that in other Gospels, right? And there's also a shift in time. John writes a lot about his early ministry of Jesus and jumps right to the end when they're arresting him and they're going to, uh, you know, the the Last Supper, and they're going to arrest him, and he's going to go to the cross. But a lot of things that John writes is early on in Jesus' ministry, and then it flips, and he puts us right to the end. And there's also a shift in the way he writes about people. Yes, there's multitudes, but you know what you know about the uh, John? And you know the stories very well. There's unique individuals that show up in Jesus' life. You know the story. There was a woman at the well, right? There was a man who came to Jesus by night, right? There's individuals that come to Jesus in the book of John that are not like that in the other Gospels. They're 
The other gospel speaks of this group of people came, the multitudes came. Yes, there's multitude in John, but it tells you about people, one-on-one, right? And the other difference is that Jesus spoke about, not parables, not find many parables in John, or little stories. You won't find them the way they are in the other ones. Uh, Instead, what you find is his long teachings of Jesus. There's long teachings of Jesus here, full of deep things, amazing things, right? And people were so amazed, they didn't understand what he was saying. Look at John 6, just on your own when you get a chance. People were going, what's he talking about? The spirit, the flesh, eating him, what, what is he talking about? There were long sermons of Jesus, teachings like that, that are not found in other ones, right? Instead of the simple, simple teachings in the other gospels, he takes you deeper. And when you understand the meaning of those deep things, you go, uh-oh, this is a divine book, and that's what John is supposed to do. And he doesn't deal, Jesus doesn't talk too much about the behavior of believers, like the Sermon on the Mount and things like that that he talks. You know what he talks about the most? Believing and trusting him and having faith that per- perseveres and goes on. You'll find Jesus talking about faith and belief and going on over and over again when we comes to a point where you go, He mentioned belief over a hundred times, and you would be right. He does, because that's what Jesus was emphasizing. And he remembered, John remembered the Lord speaking to his disciples these things intimately before the arrest, right? It's only found in John's gospel. It's called the, um, um, the, the high priestly prayer of Jesus. That's what it's called. The high priestly prayer of Jesus is found only in John's gospel. And so it's an amazing thing. So, um, and Jesus always talks about himself, by the way, in John. Uh, why? Because he's letting you know who he is. You'll find the seven great I am. Does anybody know them, by the way? I wrote them down, so I'm cheating. But anybody know them, right? All right. The, I, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world, right? I am the good shepherd. I am the door of the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? I think I got seven there. Uh, I'm the bread of life, light of the world. Good shepherd, door of the sheep, resurrection and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. I'm missing one. I am divine. Thank you. I am divine. Thank you. Should have read my notes. Yeah. Um, so John speaks of the deity of Christ. Absolutely. The deity of Christ. And John writes us about the glory of the only begotten Son. Very important document, by the way, to sustain us in the last days. Because that's going to sustain us. In the midst of apostasy and people changing their minds about Jesus, guess what you're going to do? You're going to stand firm who Jesus is. You're going to stand firm on who he is and what he's going to do. And we're going to contend for the faith. And we're going to deal with the apostasy. And it's going to be an antidote to your own apostasy and falling away. And when we, when we see the emergence of Antichrist in our world, uh, our vision needs to be Christ. And our hope needs to be the victorious, glorious Lord. And that's what John is presenting. And so it's a unique thing. Plus, here's your homework. The unique thing, go to John 1, finally. right? Go to John 1, finally. And purposely, I am building a large porch so the house can be bigger, right? Um, it starts with the prologue. I'm not going to read it because Nora did it for us. It starts with the prologue, 18 verses. I don't want to call it an introduction because it's not an introduction. It's a theme. Everything you'll find in the first 18 verses are found in the, in the, in the rest of the book. The rest of the book can be summarized in these 18 verses. Whatever you found in those 18 verses, it's later on explained in the, in the book in depth about John the Baptist, about Jesus being the light of the world, about being the word of God, right? It's a summary of everything else he's going to talk about. And so for us, guess what? Uh, I'm going to ask the Lord to to really help you and help me to memorize 18 verses. That's going to be your your assignment. When is it due? Well, that's between you and the Lord. I'm not going to check on you. Although I might stop you sometimes in the fellowship area. So, John 1, 18. <laughs> and I'm going to record it. <laughs> but just between you and the Lord. I always said, get God's word into you, and you will be better off this year, right? We read the Bible. We get into God's word, so we get God's word into us. And we're going to be so close to, to Jesus, and we're going to have to, you know, really handle it with care because... The words he's going to speak to us are going to be unique. And John is going to take us closer and closer to the heart of Jesus because that's where he went. Don't you like to experience 
where somebody's gone already? John was there, right next to our Lord, hearing his heart, hearing his words. And there's something marvelous about the 18 verses there. They're worthy to be written in gold, I think. They're worthy to be written in gold. And so many have wondered in amazement. So many people have come to Christ, by the way, just by reading John 1 through 18. They couldn't believe it. They read it, and they come out and go, who is this Jesus? I, I must follow him. All right? um, but we still haven't asked her the question. Why was it written? Why did he write it last? He could have written it early. He could have said, I'm going to get my gospel in. I'm sure all the churches know who Jesus is. No, he, he you know, let Mark do it and, and then Matthew and then Luke. And it seems to be for a while that was the books that were there. And then the letters of, letters of Paul actually were written a little bit earlier than, than, than uh, Matthew and Luke. And then James was written earlier too. So there was these books already circulating through the church. And John had not written his not that people were asking yet, but you know, we're getting to the 60 AD, 60. We're getting close to that time of the destruction of Jerusalem, 70 AD. And John hadn't seemed to write his gospel yet, right? And he wrote it a little bit later than that. Some say 75 to 80 AD, maybe closer to 90 AD. But he's up there now. He's about 80 years old. He's about 80 years old when he wrote it, right? And so... Um, Best guess scenario, right? We don't know exactly when he wrote it, but a best guess scenario. And he had thought about this for a long time. Remember, he'd been walking with Jesus for three and a half years, and now he's seen the church grow and go through difficult times. And, and by the end of his life, persecution had arisen in his own private life too. And so he is thinking about how to, how to help believers, how to get to know, how do I express the person that I know. And maybe you know somebody great in your life and you're like trying to explain to your kids or somebody in your family who you know. And in some sense, it's almost like, seems to be words cannot contain. I can imagine trying to contain Jesus and just words, who he is and what he did. And, and it's interesting too, the more, you have, we have older believers here in this fellowship. And I don't mean older in age, older in maturity, hopefully. And we have newer believers, not as mature, right? That's what I'm referring to. Talk to an older believer and, and hear how they talk about Jesus. And talk to a newer believer and hear how they talk about Jesus. And you figure out that there's quite a difference, isn't there, sometimes? They seem more to talk about what Jesus done for them. And then the older believer thinks, tends to talk about who Jesus is because they're falling in love with Jesus more. They get to know him a little more. There's a depth to their life. Maybe they've gone through trials and Jesus got them out of them, right? And you can see that in a, in, in a person's life, right? Now, the person of John, Jesus chose 12. He did. He chose 12, and for three and a half years, he loved them. He loved them. What was he absolutely loved them. And fishermen, right? Fishermen, a tax collectors, some zealots. Uh, Judas was from the south. He was from Jerusalem. And uh, he was actually not from Galilee. He was actually from, this, uh, from the area of Eskeriot, down in the south. And out of the 12, didn't Jesus have a closer circle that were closer to Jesus? Yeah. Uh, and you know their names? Peter, James, and John. They seem to be everywhere. They seem to be at the... Uh, I love that story, right? Jesus brings... He goes to uh, the, 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 the little girl he lifted, Talita Kumi, right? Jairus' daughter. He goes into the house, and all the 12 are there, but he only brings Peter, James, and John and mother and father of the, of the little girl, and then he raises her from the dead. Talitha Kumi, rise up, my little lamb. At the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, James, and John, right? Um, but out of, all those, out of all those three, there was yet one who really loved Jesus more than the other. Now, Jesus loved them all, but it says of John that he loved John. Why? It's because John loved Jesus deeper more intense. There's a fervent love. Uh, I would venture to say here, we all love Jesus. I mean, I, I would venture to say that if I, yeah, no show of hands, but you know, cause I'm kind of begging the question, but you love Jesus. But if I ask how much you, you love Jesus, you would say, well, a lot. Well, what, what does that look like, right? Um, it looks like by spending time with them. It looks like by being next to him and being more like him, right? It looks like spending time with him. You can't love somebody you, can't spend, you don't spend time with, right? And so John was present in a lot of times at Jesus' most difficult times. He was present at the trial at Caiaphas. I uh, kind of walked by where the, 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 they believed the, the, the palace of Caiaphas was when I was in Israel. Uh, 
Peter was outside the courtyard, but John was able to come in all the way into the palace, right? John was the only one of the disciples at the cross. John reached the empty tomb with Peter, but he went ahead first, but he didn't go in. Peter went in, but John reached the empty tomb first. And of course, um, you know, John was ministering with Peter, you know, at the beautiful gate where that lame man was, was able to stand. Uh, John is, was very unique. In fact, we were told a story where he actually leans on the chest of Jesus. He leans on the chest of Jesus, and people are figured out, like, trying to figure out, like, how did that happen? I mean, you look at the, at, at, the, at the painting of the Last Supper, and they're all, like, lined up this way, right? Uh, you know, as wonderful paintings are, I don't have any problems with them, right? And sometimes we get warped view of how it looked. It didn't look like Michelangelo, right? He didn't, he didn't you know, paint, he painted it according to the Renaissance. But if you go back to the first century, they had these things called a triclinium. A triclinium is basically like a, a little table. It was very short, and you had, they call them a couch, but they were like pillows. And you laid on those pillows, your head tore the table, and your feet kicked out. So in reality, you could be really close to a person, if you simply leaned on your on one hand, your feet kicked out this way, and you could be right next to the person, that, uh, so close, you know, it's like sitting in a chair like you are now, but you imagine if you threw your feet out right now and you leaned over to the person next to you? Okay, hopefully you know them, right? But, the, you know, would you say, okay, that's closeness, isn't it? Now, hopefully that's your spouse, right? But, you know, uh, but... The idea here is you, you know them, you, you have a relationship with them, deep relationship with them. If you were to walk into one of the suppers of the disciples with Jesus, not just the Last Supper, but just any supper, where's John? Oh, there's Jesus. If you look for Jesus, you'll find John. Where, where was John all the time? At his chest. What's he doing to John? He's talking to him. We can't hear him. Yeah, that's what... It's, it's, we get there sometime this year. Um, it's interesting because when the disciples are there, right, and Jesus is saying, one's going to betray me. Who's the only one that knew who was going to betray him? John. How did John know? Because Jesus told him. He was right next to him, right? The other disciples are going like, ask him who it is. You know, you can see Peter on the other side. I, don't, I can't hear what you're saying. Who is it? And John's going, Jesus, is it really? Is it really us? And he says, no, he would tips the bowl with me. And that would have been Judas. So he knew. Why did he know? Close to Jesus. How are you going to know? You need to be close to Jesus, right? There may be other disciples who are going like, how is this brother talking to Jesus like that? How is, he, how is the Lord using him? How is, what's, what's up with that prayer meeting back there? We're talking to Jesus. And John loved Jesus more than the other apostles. I understand they didn't have love. But we began to kind of see the affection he had for Jesus, right? The 12, the 3, forget the 12. He had 70 at one time. He had 500 at one time. But then you see this inner circle, 500, 70, 12, 3, and John. I was, some people would say, I just want to be one of the 12. Don't you want to be one, John? <laughs> Don't you want, I mean, it's not like it was like the, you know, there's one room, one seat, and that's it. John's got it too bad. No. The Lord has plentiful seats for you to be close to him. The only question is you. The only question is me. Am I willing to be close to Jesus? Because being close to Jesus may jeopardize other relationships that I have. May, I may have to get, you know, drop things that I kind of enjoy sometimes because maybe he doesn't like for them to be in my life. And John responds to Jesus with love. And Jesus loved them back And the relationship was so unique. So when you read John, guess what you're going to get? The love of Christ poured into your heart through the Holy Spirit. And then your response needs to be like John. Lord, can I lean on you today? We all need to lean on Jesus, right? And we sing that song, leaning on Jesus, leaning. It's not just figuratively, but, you know, and uniquely, we're leaning on him every day, reading and spending time with him. Because Jesus is a real person. Because we don't see him. I mean, he's not real. But John is the closest to Jesus. He's the closest that any man on earth ever got to Jesus. Think about that. The closest, if you, 
if there was a man that was close to Jesus today, you would say, man, I want to talk to that guy. Well, you can read all about him. A man that came to Jesus so much closer to Jesus than any man has ever lived. That was John the Apostle. And so John is interested in Jesus. The inside story. Don't you want to know the inside story? Wasn't there a show called The Inside Story one time? It was like a, like a gossip show or something like that. The Inside Story. I, sorry, I'm showing my age sometimes. And uh, the, the inside story, the, the inner person of Jesus, right? What the miracles were about. Why, why is he writing seven miracles, right? Now, John tells us why he wrote it. Now, I want you to go to the last book, last chapter of the book. He told us why he wrote it, John chapter 20. Now, look at John chapter 21. John chapter 21 the last verse, the last verse, verse 25. There are many other things which Jesus did in which if they were written in detail, I would say, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. So John did not write everything that Jesus did. It would have been incomprehensible for all of us to really understand all that Jesus did. There would not be enough books in the world to contain them in this world, to contain all that Jesus did. But the ones that he wrote are for us to know, John 20, for you to believe and for you to have life. In fact, all throughout the book, John is telling us about Jesus. In fact, the first miracle, the first miracle is quite unique. It's the Water turning into wine. It's a great story. And um, it's more than meets the eye, by the way. It, it's, it's not just, wow, that's cool, Jesus made wine. Uh, no, it's, it's really more about his word and his spirit. And the reality is, at the end of that miracle, he says, the beginning of miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Right? John begins to tell you, every time there's a miracle, watch the word belief. Watch the word that Jesus is able to, what, what Jesus is able to do and what our response is supposed to be. And the high point of Jesus' ministry in the book of John is, of course, when Thomas, he wasn't there at the, uh, when Jesus appeared after the resurrection. But Thomas says, unless I put finger in his, the wounds of his hands and I put my hand in the piercing of his side, I will not believe. That's interesting Thomas gets a lot of backlash for being doubting Thomas, right? Uh, but Thomas was a very faithful man. He just could not believe how wonderful that news was. Because immediately after Jesus shows it to him, what does he say? My Lord and my God. It's like if John is saying, I'm showing you these things so you know who Jesus is, and you know he's not just a man. He is the divine son of God, and he is God. He is God himself, that even they worship him, Right? And the whole world could not contain all the things that Jesus did. So how can you write about the things that he, he did? So that you could believe in his name. I'm going to choose seven major things, John says, that it's really going to just blow your mind who Jesus is. And if I wrote all, everything that Jesus did, it, it would not be enough. The world would not be enough. So I'm going to write about belief a hundred times, a hundred times, the word belief comes up more than a hundred times. I should say it's the word for trust to hold on to, to, uh, to rely, to lean again. Uh, And then the most important thing a man's life is to believe in Jesus. And I'm going to work with the word belief. It's not just a mental thing. It's to believe certain things about Jesus. First of all, that he is the Messiah. He is the anointed one that God brought into the world to save us. And that he is the son of God, the God in the flesh, right? To take away the sin of the world, to redeem us, right? And this is the hope, the hope of the Messiah. And that's what you need to believe in him. That's why. Not just believe, you know, like a historical figure, but believe more than that. He is the son of God. He is the son of man. And there are important things in this book to believe, right? Um, Now, most people will say they believe in Jesus, that he was a man, that he was a good man, that he was a good prophet, but that doesn't mean they have life. John says the reason what you need to believe is that you may have life, eternal life, spiritual life, ongoing life. See, the belief, if it's true belief, if you're going to just take that word believe as I need to just 
have a mental capacity to know who Jesus is, but that belief will turn into trust and, rely, and, and reliance and ultimately eternal life, that you may have life because he is the Messiah who is going to bring you life. Now, I told you, John has this Greek tenses that are kind of unique. Um, the word believe and the word live here are written in a Greek tense that is unique to John. It's called the present continuous. Technical ter terms, but just bear with it. It means that it just doesn't mean a moment in time you believed, like in 1995 or 1996 or 2004. You believed. But it's, a, it's written like this. These, these are written, these things are written, that you may go on believing that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that you will go on living in his name. Both the word believe and the word live are written in this present continuous tense, which is amazing because sometimes our translations let us down, doesn't it? Because it just says the word believe. Now, some modern translations, praise God, are changing it and making it closer to the truth. That is not a moment in time where you say, I believe in Jesus and I'm going to go my way. No, that I will continue to believe. Believing, believing is just the beginning. My brothers and sisters, you just started the walk. You just started the race. And John says the most important thing is to believe, but the most important thing in believing is continuing to believe, is continuing to live in Jesus. And it's wonderful to give that to young Christians. I wish they'd done it to me. That it wasn't something that they just, you know, here's your thing, you have eternal life, go your way. You have it. You got your ticket. No, it's that you continue to adore and worship and walk with this person that you have started to believe and that you go on believing so you go on living. And after 60 years, he's telling us what he's taught for 60 years. And it's, it's, it's really important. I think it's very effective for us to tell new believers. That's why we give it to new believers, right? That's part of the answer too. So that they would continue to believe, not just, okay, I, I, there was that one time I went to that crazy church up in Devor and you know, I, just, you know, I believed and you know, we're good now. 30 years later, ah, you know, I believe, right? Are you believing today? Are you trusting present continuous action Jesus today? Have you trusted in Jesus today? Right? Well, I did 20 years ago. Why well, are you trusting him now? What changed? He didn't. We did, right? And so from the youngest to the most seasoned believer, we all need this, right? Because you could say, well, 20 years, I'm good, I'm still here. Continue to believe. Continue to grow. So some people believe that you can outgrow your faith in Jesus. Oh, this is so simple. Can I just believe and live? You know, it's so simple. Like, I have one more. My friend, you ready to go in deep with John? He might shock you at times. We go, I don't even understand what that means. And I'm 20 years in the Lord. That, yeah, that's me sometimes. Because I go, sometimes I read this Bible and I go, it's like I, it's like I just started reading it. It's, 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 it changes me. It changes my perspective, my outlook. And the tragedy is that people change their mind about Jesus, don't they? After 20 years or 15 years or five years or something, something tragic happens. And that is they begin to descend and further away from Jesus. And they begin to change their mind about who he is. He's not all and all. He's some and maybe a little bit. He's not the all in all that we once thought he was, right? And it's an important today to read John as it was your first day that you became a Christian, right? To keep our faith. Now, John, I'm finishing this. John lived in Galilee, at some point moved to Jerusalem. The Bible tells us that he was a pillar of the church in Jerusalem along with Peter and James. And so he lived there. But later on in his life, he moved to Ephesus. He moved to Ephesus. And um, I could tell you more of the story about how he got to Patmos, which he was persecuted by Domitian, the emperor. And the persecution had begun so heavily that he was taken to Patmos. It wasn't a fancy vacation island. I, I had a friend who says, look up Patmos. And he looked it up and he said, man, that's a nice place John was staying at. No, 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 no. It what, didn't look like that now. That was a vacation spot. It's gorgeous. Back then, it was, a, it was a penal colony. It was a minefield. It was, you would go there to die working in the mines, and it was very hard on an old man. I can tell you more about that, but I'm going to leave it for maybe for next time. John lived in Ephesus at one point. He had moved there, and he had been taking care of Jesus' mother, taking care of Jesus' mother. At the cross, Jesus says, take care of my mom. 
there was a knock on the other, kill, on the other children, per se. Um, they weren't believing yet. But I think Jesus commanded John to take care of his mother for one specific purpose. Who else but to know more about Jesus than John? But John didn't know a lot about his birth and what happened in the beginning. And who knew him better was his mother. And so John spent a lot of time taking care of Miriam. And guess what she was telling him? All about Jesus. Things he didn't know because he only met Jesus probably maybe at the uh, you know, family gatherings or so because they were probably related. Uh, but he didn't know him deep and, and, and well and didn't know the stories of Bethlehem. He didn't know what happened there. So he got a lot of information from, from Jesus' mother. But the emphasis here is when he lived in Ephesus, he was an elder. He was, he was called John the Elder. And it's interesting because tradition says that when he was in Ephesus, the church that Paul planted, he had become one of the elders there, he was a very old man. And tradition was that he would, be, he would want to go to church. But he was so old, he couldn't get there himself, so they would have to literally go to his house, and the young men in the church would carry him all the way to the church, which it wasn't like down the street sometimes. It would be several miles. Imagine having that desire as an 80-year-old man. I want to go to church, but I can't walk. So I'm going to call these guys up, and you come pick me up. And literally they did. They picked him up and got him there. And John will emphasize more and more about Jesus. But something was happening in Ephesus. One thing unique about John's gospel is that John begins to talk about John the Baptist right away. There was a man called John. And in Ephesus, if you read Acts 19, in Ephesus there was a problem. Some people had not heard of Jesus. They had only heard of John the Baptist. In fact, Paul encountered some of these guys, and they said, we have only heard of John the Baptist, only the baptism of John. And Paul explains it, of course, and, and, and you read the story in Acts 19. But there was a thing about John the Baptist in, 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 in the world. This is how famous John the Baptist was. There was parts of the world that had not heard of Jesus yet, but they had heard of John the Baptist. So guess what automatically people began to think? I'm John the Baptist's disciple. In fact, there was many. In fact, the disciples of Jesus were John the Baptist's disciples at one point until they saw him. And then John said, follow him. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But there was this prevalent idea that John was in a... Was, you know, remember they came to John and says, are you the Messiah? And he says, I am not. There was this idea that John was the Messiah and John was in Ephesus where people had this misconception. Remember, remember it's far away from Jerusalem and news didn't travel that far. I mean, that fast, that far. So John begins to talk about John the baptizer, John the Baptist, showing him that he is the lesser light, but Jesus is the greater light. That it's not what John, it's not who John is, it's about what John said. It's about who would come, right? And so now you can hold Jesus with everything you have because he's the greater light and he's greater than anybody, even greater than John the Baptist, who is the greatest man who ever lived, Jesus said. But he said, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and loosen his sandals. So we're dealing with somebody greater. So he begins to write this gospel, but there was something else that was maybe more sinister. I'll end with this. In the Greek world, and Ephesus was in the Greek world, there was this view that material and spiritual were so far apart they would never meet. The material and the spiritual were far apart. The temporal and the eternal were too far apart. Right? The, um, uh, the, 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 the divine and the human were too far apart. And they held those things in concept, meaning that if, if they, they, they valued spiritual things, but fleshy things, carnal things, temporal things, those are evil things. And so the Greeks began to develop the idea that the spiritual is good, the temporal, the physical is bad. And so what do you do with Jesus? Because where do you put him? Is he physical or is he spiritual? Is he eternal or is he temporal? Is he human or divine? So the problem was they began to say, well, he could not be spiritual because, I mean, he could not be physical because the spiritual is good. If something becomes physical, it's evil. So Jesus only pretended to be physical. He was only pretending to be a man. But he was like a ghost, a spirit. He, he wasn't eternal, or he wasn't temporal. He was always eternal. So they began to think that Jesus had only appeared to be human, but not in human form. He only appeared to be human. So he only appeared to have a body. 
Because if he did have a body, he would be evil, they said, the Greek philosophers. So they began to change all kinds of things about Jesus. Jesus was not the God-man. Jesus was only an exalted divine being, but never a man. And it's interesting because the Bible makes it clear that it was God who purchased the church with his own blood. Right? Think about that statement, right? That God himself purchased the church by dying on the cross for us, right? So if he's human, they said, then he can't be divine. If you're saying he's human, because that was the church was saying, hey, he's also human, then if he's human, then he can't be God. And all these teachings stem from that, right? And they stem even to us today. Yeah, there's, there's, there's really wacky teachings about Jesus everywhere you go. I knew a guy, I, I knew a guy who's a South African pastor who completely changed his view about Jesus and his eternal sonship, that he's not eternal son, that at some point he became the son in time and, in time and space. Heretical crazy stuff. But he didn't believe that before. I guess maybe hidden. But in correct view of Jesus, correct, incorrect view, some said, began to say he was a super angel because they were trying to sort of marry the ideas that Jesus was human and divine. They said, well, he can't be. So maybe he's a super angel. Jehovah's Witness, other cult, right? Got those teachings from there. So according to the tradition, now this is tradition. I'm not going to go on history here, but it makes sense. The elders of the Ephesian church, the elders of Ephesus, knowing what Paul told them, that they need to watch for the flock, they came to John and said, John, we got a big problem. There's a lot of young believers that are starting to lose faith in Jesus. They're not worshiping as who he is, God in human form. They're losing respect for him. They're losing sight of who he is as an amazing, amazing being who is God in human form. And he says, would you write a book that can correct the errors that are being formed in the church? And John agreed. And he began to write this book. It was written to counter the attacks on the person of Jesus. And my friend, if you think that's first century problem, they're going to come people knocking at your door, peddling to your door, and they're going to tell you crazy things about Jesus that are not in scripture. And you as a Christian need to stand firm because in the last days, there will be many who will come in his name There'll be many who will pretend to be Christ, and there'll be many who will pretend to save you or bring some kind of salvation into your life, and ultimately Antichrist. And the Bible says he will deceive many because they would abandon the worship of Jesus, and they will begin to worship an Antichrist, somebody who takes the place of Christ. And the greatest lie in the world is that the Antichrist will be the savior of the world and not Jesus. And you or your children or your family is going to have to stand in those days and we're going to have to stand with John, and we're going to have to say, no, he is the real truth. He is the God-man. He is divinity in human form. He is the God who came to save us. And some encouragement, because John didn't just write the book of John. He also went on to write the book of Revelation, and in that book he said, I, John, in Patmos, write to you, suffering for the name of the Lord and for the sake of his name. He suffered and he inspired the church to stand in difficult times. So he wrote John and Revelation for a very wonderful purpose to help us stand so that you don't fall away, so that your family doesn't fall away. As for you, you come and follow me. And I want to pray for you guys. I want to pray that if you, perhaps today, New Year, have felt maybe far from Christ, perhaps not as close as you once were, this year, this past year, certainly took a toll on you. And you want to make it a point, a commitment in your life to really draw close to Jesus, to really love him. As John said, he leaned on him and leaned on his chest and to really follow him, to really love him, not just in words, because we could all say it, but in action and behavior, in a change in your thinking and in your lifestyle. 
We're not in Patmos. John was. And he told them, I've endured. I've endured the treatment. I've endured the difficulties. But I stand following Jesus. So if that's you and you want to draw, draw close to him this year through this book, I'm not telling you you're going to do it in some miraculous way or you're going to have to stand on your head and do some kind of ritual. No, you're going to do it by knowing him on the basis of his word. And so I invite you to stand and pray. If you need prayer, I'm going to ask you to, to stand. And if you really need to draw close to Jesus, if you're, if you're just dissatisfied to where you are, with the Lord today, and you just want him more. You just, I want to lean on him. I want to I want to hear what he has to say, especially about the last days. Then I want to pray for you. So if you don't mind, if that's you, you can stand, and I'm going to pray for you. And you can receive the same power, the same spirit that John had. To not to give up, not to stop, The finish line is just ahead, but you're going to need Jesus to help you. And the same Jesus is waiting at the finish line. And the same Jesus is saying, come on, come on, get to know me. You can't love me unless you know me. You can't say you believe in me unless you know me. So start there. What about, what about Frank? What about Art? And what about those who... As for you, you come and follow me. Let's pray. Father, in the name of your son, oh, you're a loving father. You gave us your son and you gave us his spirit to live inside of us by faith. We trust you, Lord, today that you have opened our hearts and our minds to this glorious book. We pray, Lord, that And we know that it's not a coincidence that at the beginning of the year, we, be, we embark in something that it's going to be a challenge. And no doubt, every fiber of my laziness and fiber of my inadequacy scream, screams now saying, no, we can't do this. But Lord... Help us to pick up our cross right now. Deny ourselves and follow you on the basis of your word. And Lord, we cherish this wonderful writing of John as if he would be teaching it. Lord, I would want to hide in a hole personally because I don't want it to be misconstrued that it's me, but it's John. It's the spirit of Jesus. It's, it's you, Who's speaking to us. And we're so thankful for John to be able to be such a, uh, a man who was transformed, a man who loved you, a man who desired nothing else but you, and for others to desire nothing else but you. And in a challenging time of apostasy and of persecution, he wrote these, not only the letters, but the gospel and the book of Revelation to inspire us to keep us close to Jesus because that's whom we're going to need. Lord, I pray, my brothers and sisters here, Lord, you see their hearts, you know their need today. You know their weaknesses, you know their, maybe their unreliability and you know, God, that maybe in their own self they can't do it. But Lord, I know that you can And so, Lord, we're going to stretch out our hand and put it in the king's hand and say, Lord, lead me, help me, strengthen me. Give me your love. Give me your truth. Give me your spirit and help me to walk with you. Help me to walk with John to get to know you, to be inspired, to talk to others about Christ. Lord, I thank you and I bless you and I praise you this morning for what you'll do in the hearts of your people today. I thank you that you have not left us orphans. You have not left us to our own accord. You have given us your spirit. And so, Lord, I pray you pour it out on each one of us tonight and that we would be changed by obeying you and following you. And we'll become like you. We become loving. We become 
full of love for you and full of love for others. We become truthful. We become honest. We become more faithful. And so, Lord, we thank you for what you'll do. We got a whole year ahead, and we look forward to walking with John to get to know Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. And um, amen. Praise Jesus. Now you heard about him, let's sing to him. And uh, Brother Christian will lead us. God bless you guys.